is Jody Edelson Wiseman. I am a speech language pathologist here at Burke Rehab Hospital. Uh, the goal of my uh, short lecture here today is to talk to you about what we do as a speech language pathologist. We um, are able to work with individuals anywhere from the age of one day old to over 100 years old. And we do, we cover a variety of areas. One including which is speech, which is the actual um, way your uh, speech sounds. Um, the second is language. And there's five major areas of language. Uh, one is your receptive language. So if you're understanding what I'm saying, if you can follow directions, raise your hand, uh, point to the door, and following complex directions. That's uh, auditory comprehension, receptive uh, language. Expressive language is if you're able to um, communicate what you need. So for example, right now I'm communicating to you this lecture. Uh, so that's my expressive language. Then there's reading comprehension and uh, writing uh, comprehension as well. And so that's uh, basically language. Then there's cognition is another major area. And that's your overall thinking skills, your memory, your problem solving, your awareness of your deficits, um, your executive functioning, your attention to um, anything that you do. We help uh, people in that area. Uh, the fourth area is your voice. So the actual sounds of your voice. Um, if it's very groggy sounding, hoarse, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail later. All right. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the stages of the swallow. And um, why swallowing is important is obviously if you don't swallow the right way, things can go down the wrong way, um, and that could cause for choking um, and coughing and uh, an aspiration pneumonia. So the stages of the swallow is first the uh, oral stage of the swallow, and that's the actual getting the food into the mouth and holding it in the mouth. So if you think, for example, of taking a bite of bread, you first have to have um, a good dentition, or some people that don't have good teeth, um, they use their gums, getting into their mouth, chewing it up, using the saliva in your mouth, um, holding it with your cheeks and your tongue, chewing it up, and you form a ball. And this all happens within a couple of seconds. That's all the oral stage of the swallow. As soon as uh, that ball of food kind of hits the back of the mouth, then the pharyngeal part of the swallow occurs. And that's when, um, this is an involuntary stage of the swallow, and the food or liquid passes through the pharynx, which is this area here, and a lot of things happen in a split second time. And the actual moment when you swallow, you actually are not breathing. Um, your vocal cords uh, close, there are two white bands, and your vocal cords close immediately. Um, your larynx elevates, your epiglottis closes, uh, covers over, and um, the food passes through, and it should be passing through into the esophagus. If it passes through uh, to your vocal cords or below your vocal cords, that's a, that's a penetration or aspiration. What uh, a healthy individual would do is they would cough and cough and cough and, until they, they clear it. Um, some people don't feel the food or liquid going down the right way or even their saliva going down the right way. So they may not cough, they may not feel it, and they may not be able to get that um, food or liquid up. Uh, specifically with the po population of the uh, uh, individuals with pulmonary uh, issues, they may have a real difficult time um, swallowing and also clearing uh, their food if it goes down the wrong way. Everybody does aspirate a certain amount of, um, of their saliva and their food. Uh, I always give people the example of you're drinking too fast and it goes, you always say, oh, it goes down the wrong way. You cough it up and then you know, within a minute or two you feel better. Um, but we have some people that it continues to go down the wrong way and that can obviously um, run you into trouble and uh, put you at risk for aspiration pneumonia. There's a lot of different pneumonias. The uh, pneumonia that we're concerned about is the aspiration pneumonia, where um, a foreign body goes um, into your lungs. Uh, so the whole reason why we're concerned about uh, swallowing 
is obviously causing this, uh, this aspiration pneumonia. And dysphagia is just the medical term for difficulty in swallowing. The dysphagia can result in, as I said, aspiration pneumonia, uh, weight loss and uh, malnutrition and dehydration. So the common complaints that some might have with dysphagia, uh, they have difficulty chewing, uh, they become so fatigued they can't even, um, they don't even want to eat. The meal times take much longer than they used to. They cough every time they have a certain type of food or every time they drink. Um, they feel that they get food uh, stuck in their throat. Um, so those are all indications that somebody may have a dysphagia. So as a speech language pathologist, what we do is we get an order from the physician that we uh, need to take a look at the patient. And we would first do um, a swallow evaluation. We would see what foods the patients um, are allowed to have, um, or perhaps they're not eating anything by mouth now. Um, and we evaluate to see how they're doing, um, giving them different kinds of foods, uh, if we get enough information from that, we may give our recommendations of what's safe to eat or not to eat, or we may need to um, do an instrumental evaluation. And here at Burke, we, can, uh, we have the opportunity to do two different kinds of instrumental swallowing evaluations. One is the MBS, or the Modified Barium Swallow Study, which is a video x-ray of um, food mixed with barium and you get a, a side view of how the food is going down. The other instrumental uh, evaluation tool we have is the FEAST, which is the Flexible Endoscopic Evaluation for Swallowing and Sensory Testing. And this test, uh, we use an endoscope we uh, place in the nose to look down the throat and we get a different view and we can see how the person is managing their um, secretions and their food. So once we do this instrumental evaluation, we're able to determine what foods um, they're able to tolerate. Um, and uh, we have patients that are able to tolerate regular food, and obviously that's the goal for everybody. Um, but we may suggest that somebody be on a puree diet. Uh, maybe they will only be able to tolerate ground foods or chopped foods. Um, or we also have a mechanical soft, which is pretty much a regular food, just everything is, is cut up for them. Um, and then the liquids, um, sometimes people have difficulty managing the thin liquids. If you think about it, um, water or soda, that kind of goes down pretty quickly. You don't have as much control over it. So there are some individuals that may be more appropriate for a thicker liquid. So we may recommend a nectar thick liquid or a honey thick liquid that they're able to manage more. Uh, one area that everybody, uh, not everybody, but many people um, have difficulty with are pills. Doesn't mean that they have a dysphagia. Um, it just, that just happens a lot with people. They can't really handle those larger pills. So I always like to give people a little bit of advice of how they can manage their pills better. Firstly, obviously taking it with something, not taking a pill dry. Um, taking it with water or taking it with applesauce or with, um, with some kind of food. You can even put it in a sandwich um, as long as you make sure that you're eating the whole thing. If it is um, a kind of pill that could be crushed up, that certainly is helpful for a lot of people as long as it's not a time release kind of capsule. Um, and never throw your head back. A lot of people do that. I'm guilty of that as well sometimes, throwing your head back because you feel like gravity is going to kind of help that pill go back there. Um, this is not recommended. Um, this is actually a, um, a way that uh, a lot of individuals can aspirate. So just taking one pill at a time um, will also help. Um, and the last area that I just wanted to talk about is voice. Um, a lot of people that have um, had some kind of surgery uh, in the near, uh, in the in the recent past, um, or they have a tracheostomy or they're just having breathing difficulties and they're on oxygen, a lot of times their voice is affected. And um, there's different things that we do as a speech pathologist that can help that. First, we obviously wanna make sure that your vocal cords, which I spoke about a little bit before, they're just two really white, thin bands. We wanna make sure that they're healthy. Um, an ear, nose, and throat doctor or an otolaryngologist would um, be able to do that. But so some other um, helpful points um, is just making sure that your posture is good. So if you're standing up, to be standing up nice and tall. 
if you're sitting down, to be sitting, um, sitting down, um, you know, straight up, um, keeping your head lifted up. If you can see when I have my head down, you can't hear the near me as well. But as soon as I put my head up, my, uh, my voice and my projection is much better. So uh, we recommend that you just project your voice out. And I know that um, occupational therapy and physical therapy have spoken a lot about their uh, breathing and the um, supportive breathing, that belly breathing or the diaphragmatic breathing. That is also very important for good um, voice output. So um, that's a good carryover that you're learning in the other therapies to also do in um, when you're speaking. Uh, if you have any difficulties in these areas, um, before a speech language pathologist would see you, you would need to get an order from your physician. Uh, we see speech language pathologists works in both the outpatient and inpatient settings. They're also available for um, in the home environment as well. And uh, we recommend that you get in touch with your physician uh, if you have any difficulties in these.